ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೋ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯಂಕರ ವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾ ವಿದ್ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಸಮಸ್ತ ಜನ ಕಲ್ಯಾಣ ನಿರತ ಕರುಣಾಮಯ ನಮಿ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ದೇವ ಸತ್ಗುರು ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ವಿದ್ವರ ಚಾಂತ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ವರ್ಸಸ್ ಸರ್ಗಸ್ಥಿತಿ ಪ್ರಲಯ ಹೇತು ಮಚಿತ್ಯ ಶಕ್ತಿ ವಿಶ್ವೇಶ್ವರ ವಿದಿತ ವಿಶ್ವಮನಂತಮೂರ್ತಿ ನಿರ್ಮುಕ್ತಬಂಧನಮಪಾರ ಸುಖಾಂಬುರಾಶಿ ಶ್ರೀವಲ್ಲಭಂ ವಿಮಲಬೋಧನ ನಮಿ ಯಸ್ಯಸಾದಹಮೇವ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಮಯ್ಯವ ಪರಿಕಲ್ಪಿ ಇತ್ಥಂ ವಿಜಾನಿ ಸದಾತ್ಮೂಪ ತಸ್ಯಾಘ್ರಿ ಪದ್ಮ ಪ್ರಣತೋಸ್ಮಿ ನಿತ್ಯ ವಿಲ್ ಚಾಂತ್ ನೌ ವರ್ಸಸ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಟು ಟು ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಫೋರ್ ವಾಕ್ಯವೃತ್ತಿ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ ದ ವರ್ಸಸ್ ವಿ ಕವರ್ಡ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಓಕೆ ಸ್ವಪ್ನ ಜಾಗರಿತೆ ಸುಪ್ತಿ ಭಾವಭಾವೌಧಿಯಂ ತೋ ವೇತ್ಯ ವಿಕ್ರಿಯ ಸಾಕ್ಷಾತ್ ಸೋಹಮಿತ್ಯವಧಾರಯ ಘಟಾವಭಾಸಕೋ ದೀಪ ಘಟಾದನ್ಯೋ ಯಥೇಷ್ಯತೆ ದೇಹಾವಭಾಸಕೋ ದೇಹಿ ತಂಬೋಧ ವಿಗ್ರಹ ಪುತ್ರವಿತ್ತೋ ಭಾವ ಯಶೇಷತೆಯ ಪ್ರಿಯ ದ್ರಷ್ಟಾಸಿಯತಮ okay so here what we are seeing is in verse 22 it says that i am that consciousness which is directly cognized in the three states waking dream deep sleep and it illumines the appearance and disappearance of the intellect so here in verse 22 it is talking about that pure awareness consciousness that is there amidst all three states whether the mind and intellect equipment is there or not that pure consciousness remains and we talked about how in waking state when we move into dream state the whole waking world the waker the waking objects they all get negated and when we move from dream state to deep sleep state the dream world the dreamer the dream objects they all get negated right and when we move from deep sleep to waking what happens the deep sleeper and the deep sleep blankness that gets negated so all of them are getting negated in one another which tells us that that's not the actual reality actual reality is that pure consciousness then in verse 23 it establishes that if there is an illuminator of a pot ghatava bhasakaha deepaha which is the lamp if there's a lamp which is illumining the pot then we know that the lamp is different from the pot and because the pot is illumined then we know that there is some kind of luminosity or light so in the same way because there is an illuminator of the body we know that there must be some awareness in which the body is functioning and that awareness is different from the body just like the pot is different from the illuminator of the pot or the pot is different from the light 
So like the pot is different from the light, the body is different from consciousness. Like by experiencing the pot, we know that there is some luminosity or shine beneath the pot. In the same way, when we experience the body, when we experience the mind, we know that there is some awareness in which all of these things are being experienced. Because otherwise the body on its own cannot be experienced. We cannot, we cannot comprehend the body on its own. Then in verse 24, so up to verse 23, it was establishing bodha vigraha. It's consciousness. In verse 24 and 25, it's establishing our nature as ananda. So what we saw in verse 24, why are we the nature of ananda? Very simple. Sarva priyatama. Because we are the dearest of all. Hmm? Because we, when we say we love someone, we're actually loving them only because they make us happy. That's all. And because they make us happy, we love them. And whoever makes us happy, we love them. But the truth is we love others for our own sake. So we love ourselves most. And because we love ourselves the most, that means that we are the source of joy. Because whatever we love, we love because it gives us happiness. So a very simple example I'll give you. Let us say the husband loves the wife. And we saw this before, but I'm going to just give a few examples. The husband loves the wife, right? So he buys her a necklace. He buys her a necklace because he loves the wife. But even if he buys the necklace for the wife, he wants to be there when she wears the necklace. He wants to make sure that she wears the necklace. He's right there. She likes the necklace because by that act, he will become happy. Huh? So he is loving his wife because she gives him happiness and ultimately because it makes him happy. It's giving happiness to him. The act of loving his wife is giving happiness to him. So he wants to be there when she wears that necklace. Or when the wife makes something for the husband. Let us say she cooks something, she makes something for the husband. And she's doing it for her husband, but she wants to be there when he eats it. Or she wants to know how does it taste like? Did he eat it? She wants to know that. Because in loving her husband, actually, it is making her happy. It is making her happy. So she's loving him for her happiness only. Mm -hmm. So if we really think about it, the love that we have for people, we are loving them because it makes us happy. For Pooja Gurudev, Swami Chinmayananda Ji, many people had given him gifts, you know, like a, they would give him a scarf, they would give him a watch, they would give him a pen, they would give him all kinds of things. And they would come and go. And when they came to visit him, they wanted to see that he's using what they gave him. <laughs> so they would ask him, where is the shawl? Where's the scarf that I gave you? Where's the pen that I gave you? Are you using it? Where's the watch that I gifted to you? Are you wearing it? So people, they're giving, they're loving, but it is because it is pleasing themselves. And this is the real truth. And so we love ourselves the most. We love ourselves the most. And therefore, we must be that source of supreme bliss. So that, that is the first logic. Verse 24 is the first logic of Ananda. Now, verse 25 is the next logic of Ananda. Okay, so we'll read that. 
ಪರಪ್ರೇವಾಸ್ಪದತೂವಮಹಂ ಸದಾ ಮಾನಭೂವಮಹಂ ಸದಾ ಭೂಯಸಮಿತಿಯೋ ದ್ರಷ್ಟ ಭೂಯಸಮಿತಿಯೋ ದ್ರಷ್ಟ ಸೋಹಮಿತ್ಯವಧಾರಯ ಸೋಹಮಿತ್ಯವಧಾರಯ ಪರಪ್ರೇಮಾಸ್ಪದತ ಮಾನಭೂವಮಹಂ ಸದಾ ಭೂಯಸಮಿತಿಯೋ ದ್ರಷ್ಟ ಸೋಹಮಿತ್ So what does this mean? Paraprema-spadataya Because it is a source of supreme joy. Paraprema. Paraprema means supreme joy. Aspada. Aspada means literally abode or source. Taya. Taya means because it is a source of supreme joy. How do we know it's a source of supreme joy? We have these expressions. Manabhuvam. Manabhuvam means may I never cease to be. Manabhuvam. May I never cease to be. Aham sada bhuyasam. May I ever be. May I always exist. Iti. This is what our expression is. That iti is to say, this is our expression. Yo drashta, this seer, saha aham, this is me. Iti avadharaya, thus ascertain this. Know yourself to be the one regarding whom there is always the anxiety. May I ever be and never cease to be. As this seer is the dearest of all, that I am thus assert and realize. So what's the logic here? The logic here is that whatever we want to keep with us, we want to keep it with us because it makes us happy. So we want to keep a house, a particular house or a home because it makes us very happy, comfortable, we like it. There are certain relationships we want to keep because they make us happy. They make us feel secure. There are certain, let us say, objects that we like to keep. Let us say like a computer or a phone that helps us feel good, feel secure. But the minute something, that same thing makes us unhappy, we want to get rid of it. So a house initially, maybe 10, 15 years ago, though it made us so happy, now it's breaking down. It's breaking down, all kinds of repairs are needed. It's too much to handle. So we want to get rid of it. We wanted it, it gave us happiness, but now we just want to get rid of it. Or a relationship that we've had for so many years, but now it's just, we're growing out of it. We're growing out of it. We're no more interested in the same things. So now we just want to let go. We just want to go separate ways. Or a gadget, an object, it's getting old. It served its purpose. A computer 10 years ago served its purpose, but now it's quite old. I want to get rid of it. So whatever we want to keep, we want to keep it because it's making us happy. And the minute it makes us sad, we want to get rid of it. Now with the self, we never want to get rid of ourselves. <laughs> we never want to get rid of ourselves. We never, we are always uh, fighting to include ourselves in everything. Make sure we're invited to a gathering or invited to a certain party. And we love, you know, when there's pictures and reports and things about ourselves. We love to have progeny because it's an extension of ourselves. So we love being present everywhere. We like being omnipresent. Huh? We, and we like to make our presence known. 
if our presence isn't known also we feel quite odd how come they didn't recognize us how come they didn't know us so our natural inclination is may i always be nobody wants to say may i cease to be uh, even those who say that uh, i don't want to be recognized i don't want to be known etc in it there is a feeling that i want to be known as a person who does not want to be recognized <laughs> there is there is also that subtle thing so this tells us listen the fact that we never want to get rid of ourselves must mean that we are the source of happiness because otherwise we would want to get rid of ourselves the question comes then what about suicide because in suicide clearly people want to get rid of themselves right i was walking i think yesterday and i was coming back the person in front of me kept looking up kept looking up and i was wondering why he's looking up he said be careful when you walk under here because people jumped out of their balconies i said okay okay you know this is a very very serious matter so this suicide actually it is happening because of some circumstance so for example somebody has a grave disease and they cannot get rid of it so because they cannot get rid of it they want to get rid of everything but if they could get rid of the disease they would never want to cease to be if somebody said today i will get rid of your disease do you want to die no of course i don't want to die i want to live somebody who has accumulated lots of debt lots and lots of debt and because of that feeling of heaviness that feeling of weight they just want to get rid of everything but if somebody frees them from that debt do you want to go no so in suicide it is really that circumstance which is causing that feeling of wanting to get rid of oneself. If that circumstance was removed, then people would want to be. They would always want to be. Hmm? So this is the proof of Ananda. This is the proof that the self is Ananda. Now, here I just want to take a moment to distinguish this ananda maya kosha and ananda because this is always you know kind of a flimsy point between uh, ananda maya kosha and ananda when we say that the nature of the self is ananda or bliss it means that that itself is our nature it's not an experience so just like sat means pure existence Sat means pure existence. The manifestation of Sat is existing things. Existence of this computer, existence of this floor, existence of this body. Chit is pure consciousness. The manifestation of Chit is life, sentiency. Ananda is pure bliss. The manifestation of Ananda is peace in the mind. Mm -hmm. So here when we talk about Ananda, we're not talking about an experience, so to say. We are talking about our nature. So here, first let's look at Ananda Maya Kosha, then we will understand. Ananda Maya Kosha literally means bliss sheath. And this, is, this comes in the five sheets, analysis of the five sheets. This is the subtle most sheet. This Ananda Maya Kosha is the sheet where oh, one loses duality. So the, let us say the painter gets lost in the painting. Hmm? The singer gets lost in the song. The sports player gets lost in the sport. So in this Ananda Maya Kosha, there's a loss of duality. It could even be in like a Samadhi. There's a loss of duality. 
But in this loss of duality, notice that this is temporary. This is temporary. Notice that this also is an object of experience. And notice that this particular state, or some people call it flow state, this particular thing comes and goes. And notice that there are gradations to this. So sometimes it's a deep, deep bliss that I enter into. Sometimes it's just very mild bliss, right? So this is not Ananda, our nature. All these things that I've described so far is the manifestation of Ananda or the experience of Ananda. What we're talking about is not Ananda as a state. It's Ananda as our true nature. So it is not, it's never experienced. It is the subject itself. There's no coming or going. You yourself are that Ananda. You yourself are that Ananda. There's no gradation as is a deep Ananda. There's a deeper Ananda. No. That particular nature of bliss is ananda and that nature of bliss which is ananda is not caused by anything in ananda maya kosha it is you know a state that one enters into maybe by a spiritual practice or it is a, a state that one enters into because of the practice of arts and, and dance and music or sports but this Ananda is uncaused, not caused. Hmm? So that is our real nature. He moves from Chit to Ananda to tell us that whatever we are seeking, we don't need to seek outside. We seek, we need to just seek inside. That that very thing which we are seeking is within us. That's why in Taitriya Upanishad, there are degrees of happiness, okay? The first degree of happiness is called Vishayananda, means those who become happy with objects. The second is Bhajanananda, those who become happy through spiritual practices. And the third is not a degree, the third is our nature, it is Brahmananda that bliss of Brahman, or Brahman that is bliss. So in the first, when we talk about the bliss of objects, remember what we're doing is, we're going out in the world, out in the world, acquiring all kinds of objects, all kinds of experiences, all kinds of relationships, doing all of that just to feel some kind of bliss. And remember what's happening. All that's happening is there's a desire that's in my mind and when it's silenced, then I feel the bliss the most. So when these objects are acquired, the mind is silenced and I feel that bliss the most, that my Ananda nature, it expresses there. So there are some people who acquire and acquire and acquire and long for experiences to get their mind to calm down for that ananda to fully express. But those who are into spiritual practices, bhajanananda, they have discovered that it is not about acquiring objects. It's actually about renouncing objects and the desire for them. We don't need to waste so much time and effort and energy running after everything and anything. We just need to let go, let go of the desire for them and immediately that bliss shines forth. And you can try it, right? You can try it. Just silence the mind and when the mind is silent, that bliss shines forth fully. So uh, that is why in our scriptures it's said that in renunciation there is peace. Meaning in that renunciation of objects and the craving for them. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have things. 
right? But a seeker lives in whatever's their dharma, perform their dharma. Whatever comes, let it come. Whatever goes, let it go. But there's no such um, anxiety or hoping or wanting or wishing or willing. And those now who have understood this, then they are able to understand their true essence as Brahmananda, that which is the source of bliss. They have understood that outside is not the source of bliss. It's actually derived from inside. And that is who I am. I am that nature of bliss. So once we understand this, like I mentioned to you, there's no more running after the world. So when I understand that I am Ananda, I am Ananda, then there's no more running after the world. Because what will we get? Correct? It is like we are that face, huh? the original source. And there's a mirror and we're seeing our reflection. So imagine if I am this face, it is like me running after my reflection all the time. <laughs> Where's my reflection? Where's my reflection? Where's my reflection? Because everything is pulling bliss from me. So I am this face and I'm running after my reflection all the time. Hmm? What's a foolish thing? Why would I do that? But I am it. Hmm? So in this way, in verses 24 and 25, this talks about ananda, my nature as bliss. My nature as bliss. So these things we have to keep thinking again and again and again, you know, that is there really happiness outside? Or is it just in me? Now we'll go to verse 26. Now in verses 26 to 27, what is being established is Sat. Sat means that changeless presence. 26. Yasakshi lakshano bodhaha. Yasakshi lakshano bodhaha. Tvampadarthasauchyate,tvampadarthasauchyate,sakshitvamapibodhritvam,sakshitvamapibodhritvam,avekaritayatmanah,avekaritayatmanah,yasakshilakshanobodhah, so here it says, Yaha Sakshi Lakshanaha. The one who appears as Sakshi, the witness, Bodaha is consciousness, Twam Padartaha. That is what's meant by the word Twam. And saha uchyate sakshitvam. And it is said that that sakshitvam, that witnesshood, api is also bodhritvam, is also the illumining power. But know that avikaritaya, it is free from all modifications, atmanaha, of the self. So the consciousness self, which appears as a witness, is what is meant by the word thou. Being free from all changes, even the witnessing is nothing but the illuminating or illumining power of the self. So what does this mean? So first here, let us move from Sakshi to Bodha Vigraha. Then we will come to Avikara. When we start Vedanta, and how in verse number 11, there were four pointers given. Sakshi, Bodha Vigraha, Ananda, and Sat. Right? So it's in this order. In this order, we have been seeing the verses. We always start with Sakshi. Sakshi means witness. 
Why? Because it's the easiest to get to. It's the doorway. So directly, if we want to know who we are, let us say, I want to know who I am. How will you start? It's very difficult to start from Ananda. <laughs> it's difficult, right? And to start from Sat, we can also do that. I am what's not changing. We can also do that. But the easiest is just this Sakshi. Are you aware? Finished. Just ask this question. Are you aware? Now, if we start with Sakshi, are you aware? Very good. Are you aware of your thoughts? Yes, I am aware of my thoughts. You're aware, so let us say we, we talked about Sakshi, you're aware of your body, aware of your mind, aware of your thoughts. So there is awareness there, your awareness. Yes, your thoughts come and go, your body also changes, everything moves and changes, but you are there, you are there. Okay, good. So you are the witness of your thoughts. This is called Sakshi. So this is an incredible uh, stage to come to because the minute we establish we are the witness of our thoughts, we know that we are different from our thoughts and we need not get affected by them. So this is a great stage. The second stage, Bodha Vigraha, which means consciousness, is to know that Sakshi is something actually that's temporary. It's a temporary title because the witness is respect to what's witnessed. It's a temporary title. But when we say consciousness, it means that whether the mind is there or not, I am there. Right? So whether the mind is there or not. So sometimes the mind is there. Sometimes the mind is completely blank, like in Samadhi, but I am there. So when the mind is not there, there's nothing to witness. So you cannot call it witness. You just call it consciousness. So in fact, uh, this Swami Chinmayananda Ji has written this also. It's on page 90 of the book. I'm just going to read the last paragraph, right? To lift the student from his present experience of conscious thoughts, into the state of pure thoughtless consciousness, the witness concept is made use of by the teachers in Vedanta. They call this concept by a familiar term witness, defining it as self illumining the thoughts and experiences. The experiences are illusory when they cease, since there are no more thoughts to illumine, it has to express itself as thoughtless consciousness, the essential state, swarupa, of pure knowledge, jnana. This state alone is the true nature of the self, as the self is ever devoid of all changes. Hmm? So when that, is, uh, when that consciousness is referred to as witness, because there's something to witness, there's a witness, it's called sakshi. But that is not the ultimate, ultimate reality. We move on to what he calls that thoughtless consciousness, which just means that it's that consciousness without any thoughts to illumine. Now well, that is called chit, or what we call bodha vigraha, chaitanya vigraha, consciousness. So we move from that. So this is what he says. That Sakshi Lakshana, which is Bodhaha, that is Twampadarthaha. That is the meaning of the word Twam. Twampadartha. That's the meaning of the word Twam. And even if it is, we're moving from witnesshood to the illumining power, what we have to understand now, it is also Avikari, it is changeless. So this changeless aspect means it is Sat. Because Sat means ultimate reality, that reality which never ever changes, which remains absolutely the same. So this presence is always there. It's always there. Whether the mind is there or whether the mind is not there, this presence is always there. It will always be there and it was always there. 
and it never changes. So it never, it is not that, uh, you know, the, it's a, it shines a brighter light on somebody and a dimmer light on somebody. No, it's not that kind of thing. It's not how we have spotlights and we can control the intensity of the spotlight. No, it is just this changeless presence. Avikari, avikari. And that tells us it is sat, it's changeless. Okay. Now, one more verse on sat. Number 27. Dehendriya manaf prana. Dehendriya manaf prana. Ahankriti bhyo vilakshanaha. Ahankriti bhyo vilakshanaha. Projita shesha shadbhava. Projita shesha shadbhava. So here it says, Dehendriyamanaha. So, Prana hankritibhyaha vilakshanaha. Vilakshanaha means distinct. Distinct from what? Dehendriyamanaha. From the body, senses and mind. Prana from the vital air. Ahankriti from the ego. Distinct from all of that is this self. And what is this self? Projita ashesha shadbhava vikaraha. That projita, projita means it's free. Free from what? Ashesha, completely free. Shadbhava vikaraha, from the six modifications, it's completely free. And tvampada abhidaha, this is the meaning of the word tvam. Hmm? So totally distinct from the body, senses, mind, prana and ego is that which is the self. Therefore, it is absolutely free from the six modifications, which all material things must necessarily undergo. This self is the indicative meaning of the term Tao. So here, there are Shad Bhava Vikaras. Vikara means modifications, Bhava of things, Shad, six modifications of things. This is from Yaska Charya. And he says that they are jayate, asti, vardate, viparinamate, apakshiyate, vinashyati. Jayate means that a thing is born. A thing, a being is born. Asti, once it's born, it remains, it's there. Vardate, it grows, it slowly, slowly grows. Viparinamate, it matures. Yeah, it matures. Then, apakshiyate, it decays. And then, vinashyati, it gets destroyed. So, every living thing goes through six things. It's born, it remains, it grows, it matures, it decays, and then it dies. And when we look at all of these, the body definitely goes through all of those changes. We have all experienced that. And the senses also, right? When we grow older, our sense of sight, sense of hearing that goes down. Manaha, the mind, the mind also, it gets less sharp. <laughs> As we grow older, it's harder for us to remember things, to retain things. Prana, our pranas also, when we're very young, we're very energetic and hyper and we can eat a lot. But when we grow older, slow down. And ahankriti means the ego also. It, it changes and when, when people are generally young, there's a lot of wanting to do, wanting to go, wanting to achieve and accomplish. After that, people slow down. So all of these Shadvikaras, 
uh, interestingly, it, it shows also what we're supposed to do in life. Huh? So in life, we are born and we remain and we should also grow and mature. After a certain point, we should also slow down. When our body is slowing down, that means slow down. <laughs> it doesn't mean go walk around more and travel more and do more things. When the senses are failing, it means stop for a moment. Just, just, just you know, think, think about life. When the mind is losing all of its functionalities, it means maybe now it's just time to contemplate. So all of these are signs. They're signs. Like uh, we had in our Devi group on Tuesday, right? When King Dashrata of Ramayana, when he saw gray hair on his head, he didn't dye it. He said, now my time of being king has come to an end. There needs to be somebody who takes over my throne. What a beautiful thing. He saw white hair and he said, okay, now I have to back off. But we, when we see white hair, we just dye it black and say, nope, I'm going to keep going, <laughs> which is, you know, good in a way, but there's a time and place for everything. Mm -hmm. So all of these things, they change. Clearly they change because we have experienced them changing. In, uh, in this matter, we have no doubt. But it says the Atman is different from them. So if all of these are subject to modification, this is the logic, if all of these are subject to modification and the Atman is different from them, that means the Atman is not subject to modification, right? So all of these are changing, Atman is different from them, therefore Atman is unchanging, that which is without these Vikaras. This we can also understand because amidst all of the changes in our body, mind, intellect, ego, senses, we still, we still feel some sameness, right? How is it that I am able to say, I am that same person that you met 20 years ago? How am I able to say that? My body changed, my mind changed, intellect changed, beliefs, faith, everything changed. But how am I saying, I am the same person you met 20 years ago? What's the basis for that? The basis for that is Atman. That essentially, you are that changeless substratum. Mm -hmm. That is how we can say that. Otherwise, on what basis are we saying it? <laughs> Everything changed. The, the, the me that was there 20 years ago, different body, different mind, different intellect, different name, different everything. And now, 20 years later, different everything. But something is the same. But we cannot point out what that is. When we inquire deeper, we understand that it is Atman. So Sat here means that which is free from any type of modifications. It is a changeless presence, free from any type of modification, not even a wee bit of change in it. And in this way, he's established all four of them. Right? So let us see how he's established. We will just review how he has established Tvam Pada. Hmm? So where have we come? So verses 11 to 27, here 11 to 27 is where we are working on Tvam Pada. Tvam means you, Pada, the word Tvam, the word you. Okay, in verse 11, he gave the four pointers, four pointers saying that if you want to know who you are, you are Sakshi, you are Bodha Vigraha, consciousness, you are Ananda, you are bliss, and you are Satya, 
you are truth, reality, changeless. Okay. Then in verses 12 to 14, he gave some kind of logic. Uh, the perceiver of the pot is different from the pot and the pot is subject to modification, but the self is not subject to modification. So he gave some logic there, but the student said that I want something deeper. So from verses 15 to 17, he established Sakshi. Uh, he established Sakshi, Sakshi witness. Oh, sorry, the perceiver of the pot is different from the pot is in Sakshi. So the perceiver of the pot is different from the pot, Sakshi. Then he said the seer of the body, mind and intellect is Sakshi. And the seer of the assemblage or Sanghata, Sakshi. So the witness of everything is Sakshi. He established it, verses 15 to 17. Then verses 18 to 23, he focused on consciousness, saying that, listen, this consciousness is a changeless presence, and in its presence, everything gets illumined, like the sun. In its presence, everything just illumines. The, er the inert things are energized, they're revitalized like how like a magnet a magnet is just there and the iron filings are drawn to the magnet magnet is not doing anything it's not creating it's not changing it's not prompting it is just there and everything is drawn to it so the self is this changeless consciousness in its presence things are illumined things come to life things become energized and it also said here that it is that consciousness, which is the, that, there, that is there, that is present changelessly in the three states, waking, dream, deep sleep. So from 18 to 23, we emphasized on consciousness aspect. Then 24, we talked about the ananda aspect. Ananda aspect that actually this consciousness is the absolute source of joy. You yourself are the ultimate source of joy hmm? because we love everybody for the sake of ourselves. And not only that, but we are that continuous source of joy. We want ourselves to always remain. So that must mean we are the source of joy. And then in 26 to 27, he established Sat. Sat meaning that which is unchanging and free from all modifications. So in this way, he's established exactly who we really are. So in short, if I, if I want to know who I am, it is all encased in this word Tuam, you. And what is in case there is I am that pure awareness, which is changeless, free from all modifications, and that pure awareness, which is also the seat of bliss. And that's why I should find that out. And all of this he has brought, but remember, this is only one portion of the Mahavakya. <laughs> There's three, tvam, tat, tvam, asi. Right? The first word is tat, second is tuam, third is asi. We started from tuam or you because that's closest to us and that's easiest to understand. So next he's going to bring up tat. And that is from verse number 28. So we will take up tat next week. So for now we will stop here. Just one uh, thing I will add is, you know, sometimes the question comes, if we love ourselves the most, gosh, that's such a selfish way to live, <laughs> right? Because we are always loving ourselves the most. Is that the only way to live? So remember, in the state of ignorance, we are loving others because they make us happy. Right? We, we, whatever we love, whoever we love, we love because yeah, they give us happiness. 
and they make us happy and that's why we are loving them. But for a realized person, they are not loving people because they give them happiness. They don't need happiness from anybody else. They're, they don't need happiness from anybody else. They're, they're perfectly fine on their own. So they are loving because it's their natural expression. Their natural expression is love. Hmm? So that is actually unconditional love. All other love that we feel in our day-to-day -day life, even if we want to call it unconditional, it is not. It's conditioned. It's conditional. No matter how much we feel that, oh, I have unconditional love, please think, think it through. It is conditional only. Only the realized master, enlightened being, has unconditional love because they are not loving to get something. They are loving because it's, it's their nature. It's like how breathing is one's nature. It's just natural, it just happens. Hmm? Loving is their nature, right? That's why in, uh, you know, in some of the sannyas orders, right, there's different, different uh, names that are ascribed at the end. Some, some people uh, are from the tradition of uh, Giri or Vana or Saraswati, but a lot of what's common is Ananda, right? The, the, their names would change to um, an ending of Ananda like Swami Chinmayananda, right? It, it means that their nature now is of love. They're in an embodiment of love. That's Ananda. Hmm? When one has realized their true nature of Ananda, they become that embodiment of love. Okay, so we'll close here. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Shri Gurubhyo Namaha Harihi Om